And our panelists are three people you've probably never heard of. Yeah, I did. We don't like That's right. Uh, Jim and Greg Bedford, the original uh, uh, founding editors of Void, and Ted White, who uh, became a Void boy. And Void boys also included two people who are sadly not here with us today. Uh, but it, Oh, there you go. I'm just only getting That's it. right. Yes. One of the two go. known copies. Mm -hmm. One of the, right. Wow. And you can see the fine hand lettering. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so we're good. Hecto. Now. Oh, Hecto. Very good. Um, because the iPads won't stretch over there, I'm going to be old fashioned and be the slide guy. You know, so uh, so I'll let the tenured professor talk and I'll just respond when somebody says slide. <laughs> On the other hand, I will get my revenge if I start to do this. <laughs> so it is. It is up to you. I'll do the wait. This, by the way, is the last, 429. Deceptively titled Fan History on its first page. you see that? Yeah, we need to check that. <laughs> Which of us is right about what's in there? <laughs> Yes, Joe. Toward the end, I think. So there's Void One, and I just held it up with the actual copy. Here's a better copy. Yeah. And there are approximately 10 of these made. And I know that the last time there was a sale, maybe five years ago, Lickman told, tells me it's over $100, which is. Uh, a thousand times what we uh, offered it for a dime. Mm -hmm. We announced in a later issue in number five, there was number five, number six, we were going to have to make a 50% increase in the price. <laughs> Inflation, mm -hmm. 15 cents. Uh, we did this in Germany. Uh, in no, no, this was done in Atlanta. No, we didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Read, look, we wrote it up in the 80s, and it says very clearly that we did it in Germany at the top of that house on five Wurtweg Way in Thiessen, and that we bought the hectograph from Sears Roebuck International. But so, my biographers don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Biography is a form of fiction. They, uh, we, it was done in January of 1955, which means it's 65 years in the past. And we produced the first uh, six issues in 10 months, which attracted a great deal of attention from the European fans who had no regular fantasy output that was reliable and we were just turning it out and so we got a lot of European authors uh, like Ron Bennett and John Barry and uh, Julian, Jan Parr. Julian Parr John Young, Jan Janssen, and others to, to contribute and we gradually went away from this issue which is entirely produced by us uh, to, uh, to really having a good, good international uh, coterie of people there's number two uh, I did all the graphics for the first several issues for my sins. The, um, at, we shifted from issue six to seven and shifted from a European orientation to a more American Gen Z uh, format. And there on uh, to number 13, he and I were the only editors. We moved to Dallas, and numbers uh, 11, 12, 13 were done in Dallas. By that time, we actually had a rotary memory graph. In Germany, we had bought a flat. We got some quotes from the covers. We can't see them. Yeah. Well, it's not strange. It is. Now, well, well, yeah. I, you're, you're not talking about Boyd 15. Okay, what about the covers? Well, let's see. Can I, I can, okay, Boyd 1. Yeah, we've yeah, seen that. Boy two. Yes. It's this yes. way. Boy three. Yes. What's that say on the bottom? At this point, we have to issue the idea of children. Children. Three. Three. Who me? Why, I've been to an SF con. Why don't we move on? <laughs> we are. No. <laughs> uh, and well, maybe it isn't plugged in. Let's see if it's plugged in. Uh, yeah. what, what years were these? Uh, this, this was all in 1955. Yeah. Oh. All right, we haven't gotten to 56 yet. Ready to go? Next yes. Still 55. 
uh, we had uh, uh, the first time so a, a person who was real artistic talent at the cover. That was Terry Jeeves. Wasn't yeah, it? Terry Jeeves. Yeah. Yeah. And then six, uh, where we began to shift toward uh, Gen Z, and we had uh, Julian Parr and uh, Ellis Mills, now forgotten, early fan, uh, in, in 3F kind of guy, who was in the Air Force and was in Germany. Um, and number seven? Good now. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a classic, and I'm going to take one of my two copies and put it into the auction if I can negotiate a deal with Andy Hooper, uh, to, to today's auction. Uh, this is uh, uh, my, um, this is not the Metzger cover, this is, who did this cover, I can't remember. I can't remember either. It's about a guy turning the crank on a Mimeo. Well, we were using a flatbed Mimeo, which I don't think anyone else has ever heard of, which were available in Europe, in which you 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 basically went down, your stencil went down, and you inked it, and it came up, and you pull the page out. Wow. It was really like you know, like the same kind of technique, like so the same, great. The, yeah, right. yeah. Like the same technological era as the pyramids, I think. <laughs> and, and so uh, we were. It was a lot of work, but we had a lot of time. Uh, number eight was the shift over to uh, Ooh, Eddie Eddie Jones. Eddie Eddie Jones. And we had a lot of, they were starting to get thicker issues, and we were talking about the fact that we we're going to have to make a hundred of them. By that time, the hectograph was history because it lasted only one issue. But this was still flatbed, uh, and but we were still in Germany. It was 1957 by this time. Next, uh, and there we are at the top. Yeah. But uh, me being uh, a bit uh, naive and Greg being cynical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number nine. Okay, the great Adam cover, maybe the best cover. Actually, I think 13 is the best cover, but this is the second best cover. We ought to put it in the book. This ought to be in the book. The, uh, yeah. It's brilliant really yellow, by the way. Yeah. yeah. It's yellow, baby. Yeah. By the way, I have all of the first 13 issues here with me. If anybody wants to see what was actually in them and touch the holy papers. The number 10 was, here we go, number 10 upcoming. Yes. Brother Eddie Jones. Brother Eddie Jones. Uh, uh, you can't say this is pointless. <laughs> <It's> got, <laughs> points going in several directions. <laughs> And uh, it, it was uh, the last Jones, I think. Uh, number 11, on the other hand, we were in Dallas. And this shows our, <laughs> our move to Dallas. And the caption is uh, basically, what well, is our let's first, see. What is our first step in the overthrow of Dallas fandom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, notice that your void logo has changed with this issue. Yeah. It was a different lettering. Yeah. yeah. That's not a lettering guy, is it? Yeah, it oh, it's hand letter. I, it's hand. In my hand. Yeah. And that's a Renault Dauphine. We mm. got our first car with yeah. yellow headlights. It was actually, a little bigger than that. Yeah, the issue's a lawyer on top of it. And I was, uh, I was uh, so beginning to get somewhat heavy at that point, probably 170, 180. Uh, who, who drew that? Uh, Jerry Hines, who's a really talented fellow that we met in high school in Frankfurt and did several illustrations. You will see several of his in the, in, in the, lab, in the following issues. We met with him again many years later at the University of Oklahoma and yet again in Southern California in recent years where he has become an evangelical Christian. Oh, oh well, and he's in well, poor health. Well, yeah, right well, first the Air Force, then Christianity. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, number eleven is another Heights cover, I think. Uh, yes. I, I mean, right. twelve. Twelve. Okay, that's another Heights cover. Yeah, self-referential cover. It's, this is uh, double tasking. The uh, and uh, final issue in our hands, number thirteen, which <coughs> is the best issue. And this by George Metzger is a. Co cover where you see, you see, I'm there soldering electronics, uh, which is I was doing building electronic stuff all the way through Germany and Dallas and went into experimental physics, as you will hear about tomorrow. The 
Greg is over there reading science fiction. Tom Remy, who is later to become a significant writer, a decade later, is asleep. <laughs> Everybody else in there is a Dallas fan, and they're all sleepy. And the quote, if you can see it there, in fact, I'll just bring it up here to read it myself. Uh, the quote is a quote from uh, Kit Mua, ah. the, the greatly lamented Kit, Kit Mua. Quote, with the sudden appearance of the Frankfurt insurgents, we were known as the Frankfurt insurgents in parallel with the Rayburn uh, Toronto insurgents. With the sudden appearance of the Frankfurt insurgents in Dallas, I imagine Brown and Sodic and Jennings, etc., will soon burst into fanish activity. This shows them all asleep. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a, another reference. You notice the power of beer cans. Right. The figure at the bottom looking at it is a direct copy of a cartoon by Dave Reich, yeah. who took part nice. in the tower. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the first 13 issues. At that point, you, uh, <clears throat> several people have asked me this uh, today and yesterday, why did I drop out and why did the, we transition to Ted White, who will speak for the rest of this entire panel? <laughs> 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 hey, you got half the panel. It's, it's because of several events that occurred at once in 28, uh, in 58 and 59. The, the best thing I think that ever appeared in Void was Kent Muma's last column, which is a con report on the first Southwestern con, uh, which took place in Dallas in 58. It was a deeply cynical con report, as is almost everything he wrote, and very negative. Shortly after that, due to being told that he was going to be drafted, Kent Muma committed suicide. Oh, um, which was a devastating on the on his 18th birthday oh, on the day to, he was supposed to register for the draft and they told him they told him of course you'll be drafted which they told everyone oh, in no. fact only maybe 20 percent of people were drafted they didn't need that many there was no war uh but he believed it he didn't understand that's a recruiting device because they also say but if you volunteer you can choose where you go and what you do and, and your and, service and so serve, you really should volunteer and serve an extra year mm -hmm. and and he he didn't understand that that was a sales technique and, and thought he was facing <laughs> two years in the military which he couldn't bear he would have ended up editing the post newsletter <laughs> in some place in in uh, uh, europe or something and then gotten uh, the veterans benefits to go to college that's what really would have happened but he did suicide which is really devastating to those mm -hmm. of us who are good friends of his and had seen him only recently <clears throat> only months before and the other thing is that we begin to focus toward the real future and that is when we were getting ready to go to college and we had to think about the future in those days after after sputnik in 57 no. People were no. very future oriented and focused. I might say very different no. from any other it's era in, in history that I know. And so we decided that uh, we, we, we didn't have the energy to do this anymore. And we decided to quit. But Ted White came along and I dropped out. Greg continued as uh, writing editorials. And then the, the torch passed to Ted White. Which would be with number 14. Now, the way I remember it, and I'm not sure Greg remembers it the same way, but we'll find out in a moment. I got a letter from Greg. This was in the fall of 1958. Just after Kent's death. Just after Kent's death. Now, aside from Greg and Jim, I was Kent's closest friend. And uh, I had been in communication with him, mostly by mail, right up to his death. He actually said, well, see, I had just met and was about to marry uh, Sylvia Dees. And uh, Ken expressed the, the fear to another person that, now that I would be all involved with Sylvia and my marriage, he, his friendship with me would fall by the wayside, which is, of course, not true, but I had no way to reassure him once I heard that. But I got this letter from uh, Greg, and after talking about Kent, 
he told me that Jim was dropping out of Boyd and that he wanted to pass the torch on to me. He wanted me to take Boyd over. Uh, and I said, okay, but you got to stay on. You, 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 we need continuity here. I mean, I was doing a fanzine of my own called Gambit, which was a, a modest little gen zine that was picking up some steam at that point. And uh, I could have happily continued doing Gambit, but I saw Void as a challenge. You know, it was, it wasn't going to be a fanzine purely of my own conception. I was stepping into a fanzine that already had an existence and a tradition and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and I felt somewhat defensive because I, I did not want people to think that I had sort of stepped in and taken over in a way that implied that I was uh, imposing myself on somebody else's fanzine. I think that what followed the void that Greg and I did, and then that Greg and Pete Graham and I did, and then that Greg, Terry Carr, Pete Graham and I did. I think that's, it turned out to be a really good fancy. I mean, it wasn't perfect, nothing is, but we did an awful lot of good stuff in it. Now, initially, I was trying to do it monthly. So, and you did. Uh, for well, and I, the first issue came out months. around the beginning of 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 '59, like January or February. I right. don't remember. Are they dated? I can't tell. Uh, this one is not. Yeah, but but dated. it was January '55. I remember it. Uh, Sixty. Uh, uh, no, uh, '59. Uh, I mean '59. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, the <laughs> he just yeah. showed me the '55 date on Boyd One. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, until that summer, I was producing them on a monthly basis. Uh, number 15. Oh, first. oh um, that's a shot of us at the 1968 World Cup. Yeah. It was it, the only shot I could find of us together. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And look, Bacon. He had a vest. <laughs> and here's 15. Arthur Thompson. Yeah, now when I I did all the art stencil mm -hmm. for those boys. And uh, you did all the production. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, when I stenciled that cover and at least one other atom, it seemed to me that there was this draftsmanship like perfection to yes. his line. Right. And I used straight edges and French curves and whatever else I had in order to try to preserve that line. Mm -hmm. But in the process of doing it, I discovered a, a, a dirty little secret of Adams. His lines didn't connect up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did correct some of that just, just so that the geometry I would I think be he better. was a draftsman. Yeah. Well, and then also an illustrator for technical firms like air firms. And by the way, he told me that the reason he did that is that he wanted the eye to do the connecting and it would help with the perspective. That was his theory. I asked him explicitly when I met him in London in 1959. Seven. 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 Right. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, let's, let's keep going with these. Uh, that was 15, 16. There's another ad. <laughs> 17. Read the caption. The caption. He saw a, a, a photo of Miss Bardot, and we had to explain the facts of life to him. <laughs> <laughs> Which is internally. I, I was infatuated with Brigitte Bardot. I actually painted a portrait of her. Right. And that's an atom, of course. Oh. Yes, I said that. Oh. 17. Okay, now that's an interesting <laughs> cover. Avant garde. That is a. Fan who was then pretty young named Bill, Rick, Bill Rickard, Rickard right. who was originally, I think, a Detroit fan, but in 19, late 1958, he moved to New York City where he lived for, oh, maybe two or three months. Then he came down to Baltimore, which is where I was then living with Sylvia, 
and uh, stayed with us for a month or two. And that pipe that he has with a cigarette sticking out of it was a weird kind of a, a water pipe, yeah, probably a real hookah, brass, that I had found somewhere and had. I don't have it anymore. I don't know what became of it. But uh, it made it for an interesting photo, which was taken by a photographer friend of ours who we hung out with a good deal in Baltimore. He was not a fan. And that was our first use of electro stenciling in Void, or at least for the cover of Void. So we electro stenciled the photograph onwards. The benzene of sweetness, life, and delight, and euphoria. Right. That's a Jack Harness cover. <coughs> And that's also electro stencil. I, I had uh, done zipatone shading on it, and uh, Jack Harness had lived in the in D.C. Uh, starting in late '55 until '58, and we hung out a lot together. <coughs> and I collected a huge sheaf of his artwork because he was one of those artists who was always drawing all the time whatever else we were doing there was something that he was drawing and i tended to pick up most of them yeah then he moved to la and became a clear well no he moved to dc <laughs> to become a scientologist and yeah. they moved him to la but they, 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 ultimately he could only be a clear in la by that time <laughs> that's yes <laughs> well it, it was one of those one recent. of those receding horizons the closer yeah. you got to right. it the yeah. further away it was. yeah yeah right uh, and ultimately jack gave up on scientology but it took him longer than it should <coughs> all right onwards yeah yes. okay yeah. that is a picture of camp muma at midwest con with myself and john magnus and that is also electro stencil. I had found this place in Baltimore that made electro stencils, and so I took advantage of it. <coughs> was Muma still alive when this was no, 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 no. No, but he was alive when the picture was taken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I saw, I saw him at two, at two Midwest Cons. He was at the. Uh, the 58 and the 57 Midwest Cubs, and uh, that's where we first got to know each other. I ran off his fanzine for him. I mimeographed his fanzine aberration. Right. If you type Kent Muma into Google, you will find the memorial site his sister put up, complete with funereal music and a bunch of stuff about his activity. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Now, I should have mentioned that earlier uh, in Void 15 or 16 or both, because it was in two issues, we serialized right. uh, a piece of fan fiction by, by Kent. And as you all know, fan fiction is fiction about fans, not about TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kent had written this, this piece about this confrontation of two very different BNFs at a convention loosely based on the Southwestern Con that he'd gone to where, where MC Bradley had been. Yeah. And M.G. Carr, he told me, I think he sent it to me, didn't he? What, to us. story? Yeah. Or did he send it to you? I forgot. Uh, oh, he must have sent neither. it to us. We were neither. Neither. Then. His, his mother Send it to me after oh, his death. Was that it? Okay. He had been working on it. I knew. And and it sort of his his magnum opus or so. He had come and stayed with us for two weeks in Dallas in time for the first con in Texas, the Southwestern Con in Dallas, that we all put on, and and then went on bus all the way back to Ohio to uh, Cincinnati. Yeah. To uh, to his death and his second. Yeah. But uh, oh, yeah. but he wrote this story, and after I published it in two successive issues of Void, I also published it as a standalone pamphlet. Right. Uh, I published two standalone pamphlets that year. The other one was the beating up of his by Carl Brandon slash Terry Bell slash Ron Healy. <laughs> I mean, really, it was Terry Busley and some Ron Healy, all in the name of Carl Brandon. 
And uh, those were noble endeavors, but I don't think they had much impact. Uh, nobody seemed to want them. Is this working? I mean, everybody had the original fancy appearances. It wasn't like people were clamoring to buy the volumes. No. It's, it's, uh, it is ironic that there is now a Carl Brandon Society. <laughs> By the way, you missed the cover. That was 16 and a half, uh, which was an all letters issue, right, which yeah. you didn't apparently scan. But, but that's, I guess that's true because there was no cover. It was just time. Yeah, out. you're right. Yeah. But at any event, okay. <coughs> 17, oh, 18, right. 19, no, and uh, that's Adam. Yeah. Yes, okay. it is. And, and what it is is that 19 is the July issue, and 20 came out six months later. Came out in early 1960, and so I caught up. By put dating the pages, and every two pages the month changed. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but that issue, uh, the reason that it was so late was that in July of uh, 1959, Sylvia and I decided to move to New York City, and we spent more than a month looking for an apartment, which we found on Christopher Street. A, a fourth floor walk up, no elevator, and uh, but sixty-eight dollars a month. Um, yeah, but those are real dollars. Yeah, <laughs> when, the, when the minimum wage is even even then, that was considered a very decent rent. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, e even in nineteen fifty-nine, and it took us a while to to get reorganized, so to speak. New York, and the first thing I had to do once I was there was pursue my fledgling professional career, which was as a jazz critic. And so I didn't have time to do fanzines. And then we went to detention, the Detroit Worldcon, at Labor Day weekend. And much of that issue, Boy 20, is taken up with my detention con report. But uh, once we did number 20, I tried to get back on a regular schedule. Next. <coughs> Read the caption. It came to pass that man changed the old gods, which angered the true believers muchly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I should mention that the way Greg and I had been that handling me? this fantasy during Hilton, yeah. this period was Lee Hilton. Yeah. I I was uh, you didn't have much inventory to pass on. That's right. So and, and I really was very disappointed. Team. You had had some good writers in Void in the last five or so issues you did. Yeah. And we attracted a lot of good leaders. None of them passed it on to you. None of them. <laughs> Continued with us once I took over. Which There's a message there. Which not, <laughs> not pleasing. Well, a try. But I was able to generate enough material yeah. that it didn't really matter. And uh, Greg and I each did editorials that kind of introduced the zine. And I would send all the letters of comment to Greg, and he would write answers to them and organize them to some degree for the letter column. And that was, well, you, you were down in, in Texas somewhere. No, we, by that time we were at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh, you were in Oklahoma. We had gotten both four-year scholarships to go there. So, yeah. so you were not hugely involved in the rest of Void, uh, sort of by necessity. You weren't right. there. Right. And, uh, as we progress, let's try 22. Yeah. Now, 22 was our Anish, our fifth Anish. And it seemed to be something we should be celebrating. So I decided <coughs> to do Void 22 in three separate installments to monthly. To confuse the story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
in the process of doing Void 22, uh, I, I was, I needed help. I needed help with the actual physical work, typing stencils and all that. And consequently, I brought in, I think Walter Breen was only involved with one of the two, or one of the three. And then uh, he typed some <coughs> stencils for me. Yeah. He didn't do anything editorial, he just typed some stencils right. for me. In those days, Walter Breen was not <coughs> badly thought of. No. And, but he quickly discovered that there was no one in any of the Void staff of underage. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, with, with the, the third installment of Void 22, we brought in Pete Graham. Now, Pete Graham had been part of Bay Area fandom with Terry Carr and Dave Reich and later Ron Elick. And uh, Pete had published a one-shot called Lighthouse with Terry Carr, and uh, he had written a piece that appeared, I guess, in innuendo called Clayfeet Country right. about his visit to the D.C. area fandom. Some years previous. And, <coughs> yeah, just a couple. Because Greg wrote a parody of it in issue 12. Right. Well, uh, Crazy Country Revisited. In, in which uh, should Pete be. Graham goes to visit Burby and Laney and finds them less than they should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, he definitely found DC fans less than right. he thought it should be. <laughs> yeah. the, the shame of it was that he made up all of his scurrilous facts. They weren't true. He described meeting Jack Harness. Jack was standing on the porch of, of his residence in front of an easel painting a picture wearing a smock and a beret. <laughs> well, in actual fact, Jack was there in front of an easel painting a picture, but he wasn't wearing a smock and a beret. He wasn't in affectations of that sort. He wasn't trying to be a grandiose artist. He just liked to do paintings as well as drawings. But that was typical of, of, of Pete was kind of uh, a loose cannon. He was very talented. But he also could kind of go off in strange directions. Yeah. And uh, nonetheless, and even though I was somewhat, I had some trepidations about getting socially involved with him again after that experience of Clayfeed Country. But he had moved to New York City, and and he was more fanish than most of the other people in New York City at that time. And so I felt an alliance was worthwhile, and it was. And Pete was a good addition to Void. He also wrote editorials for it, and they were decent. And uh, it was helpful to have him. During the same period that he was helping us with Void, he revived Lighthouse as a regular fanzine for Papa rather than a one-shot. And when Terry Carr moved to New York City, Terry became co-editor of Lighthouse, but he did at least one issue, maybe two, as a solo editor. And the first issue he did was one in which he commissioned me to do a piece about, uh, the, well, not really the Hydra Club, but a party that the Hydra Club had held before the Worldcon in Detroit, in New York City. And uh, a lot, a lot of people like Paul Anderson and others who were on the East Coast for the World Con uh, were at that party, and I wrote a rather gossipy piece about it, which did not make me any friends. <laughs> and I, I blame that for the fact that I was banned from the Milford Conference, even when I deserved to go. Well, yeah, Pete, you, Pete, you, 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 Pete was you, not like that too. You, you right. sow Absolutely. seeds and you reap what you reap. Right. And that's what I reap. I know. Some people collected fanzine, other people collected enemies. <laughs> <laughs> so let's <laughs> do it. Simultaneously. So then in 19, uh, well, let's see. Let's continue with these covers. Let's get past Boy 22. All right. Yes. Boy 22. Uh, the beginning of the Bob Stewart multi page covers. One day there was a knock at my door, and Bob, when I opened it, Bob was on the other side of it saying, Ted, I have this really great idea for void covers. And he did. <laughs> and 
the way they were originally conceived, they were there were always an odd number of pages, either three or five, but until the end, three. So that the fourth page was the true cover. I don't know where you have that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, there you go. So after after the the three page cartoon setup, you get the actual cover. And this continued through Void Twenty Eight. So continue, please. Yeah, there's Void Twenty Four. Uh, Bob not only drew these, he also wrote them. Uh, I believe that one is uh, a takeoff on some of the other fan artists in New York City, Andy Reese in particular. Yes, who is that guy that makes it there, the, the tall fellow? I can't tell from here. Uh, I, it was a, supposed to be a specific person, but I can't remember who it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if I had a better look at it, I could tell you, so yeah, maybe a little later. Uh, continuing. Yeah. Uh, what happened to 24? Oh, I did right. 23, 24. There was 24. Yeah, I don't think I had the, uh, the, the, the third yeah. page. Yeah. 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 No, I didn't put all of them in there. Thinking we would run over. <laughs> now, this one, this one, yeah. Terry Carg. Yeah, you you don't even have all the pages of that, just the final no. page. See Terry down at the lower right yeah. of the first page? Yep. Terry Carr came to New York City that summer. Terry's first marriage to Mary had broken up, and he was working in a university library in Berkeley. And it wasn't a job that was going to take him anywhere he really wanted to go, but he hadn't figured out what else he wanted to do. But he and I both knew he really wanted to be a professional writer. And I said to him, Terry, this is the time for you to make a clean break, Berkeley, come to New York City, and explore a professional career. And become an editor of Boy. That and, too. <laughs> and to meet Pete Graham again, and take his girlfriend away and marry her. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not really true. <laughs> Carol was never Pete's girlfriend. When, when, when Terry met Carol, she was in the process of leaving her husband, Jack. Carol and Jack were members of the Young People's Socialist League, Yipsel, as was Pete. That's how Pete knew them. Pete lusted after Carol. Pete saw Carol's marriage ending and thought there might be a great care for him. Oh, so that's and why Pete told me that she was his girlfriend. <laughs> well, okay. And, 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 and instead, Terry stepped in. And uh, for a month, Terry kept his relationship with Carol a secret from, from Pete. Finally, had him over to dinner in my apartment because I was in Seattle at the Worldcon and I had given the apartment to Terry and Carol to use and to feed my cat. And so they had Pete over for dinner and told him all about it. And Pete did some unforgivable things to my apartment as a direct consequence of his reaction. Yeah. But uh, that that to one side, this cover welcomed Terry Carr to New York fandom. And that final page, the the Statue of Liberty is the statue that statuette that George Willick wanted to have for some award, a fan award? Something like something that. like that. It was designed by a guy named David Prosser. And that rendition of it there is an accurate yes. transcription, you might say, of Prosser's statuette by me, with Bob drawing the foreground. And uh, you'll also notice that Void with that issue is now combined with innuendo, yeah. which had been Terry's fanzine. And when Terry came to New York, he Volunteered. I didn't ask. He just volunteered to combine innuendo with void, and he did have some inventory. Yes, that didn't hurt at all. But the other thing that happened was that now there were four of us writing editorials for void, and at this time, I had a mimeo shop on West Tenth Street, in the Village Tower Hall. 
Well, it was officially Metropolitan Mimeo, but <laughs> Terry dubbed it Towner Hall and it stuck. Was it Toner or Towner? Towner. Mm-hmm. After Francis Towner Laney, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah, and a takeoff on Town Hall. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So uh, the Mimeo shop made very little money, not least because Larry Janifer kited a number of bad checks on us for printing up scripts for him. Um, but it was a Spanish hangout. There were fans there nearly all day. In addition to myself and Pete and I guess Terry, we all had keys to the place. I think Bob Stewart also did. And and so there'd be somebody there from fairly early in the morning till fairly late at night. I had a, a new Gestetner 360, uh, several desks, several typewriters, and Terry would come in in the mornings and write stories. Uh, in the afternoons, I would be there and we would be doing fanzines. I mean, in addition to Void, we did Lighthouse, we did Jeff Wanchell's fanzine, we did Mike uh, McInerney's Hickleplod, we did just about anything that any fan brought stencils to do. And uh, there were always fanish chitter chatter. Uh, People joking around, kidding around. That's where the phrase make a BNF happy what originated. It's when Terry or I would send somebody across the street with a quarter to buy us some Pepsis or Cokes. Because across the street was one of these places where they had a machine or I don't know what you really call it a machine. It was like yeah. a chest into which Water. bottles were placed in cold water which right. maybe had ice in it and the bottles were all in these little guideways slots yeah and you put a coin in and then you guided a bottle to the point where it would release and you could get one out and this was not expensive it was probably 10 or 15 cents and so if one of us got thirsty we would ask somebody like Andy Main or uh, Bob Stewart, Les Gerber, or somebody like that to go across the street and get us some Pepsi. The phrase came up, how would you like to make a BNF happy? cartoon <laughs> 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 later appeared, except it was addressed to a young lady. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, in the process of all of this, we would be writing material for Void editorial material, letter column responses, that kind of thing. And Terry might be typing up his editorial and he'd stop in the middle chuckling, read a few lines to Pete and me, and and uh, we would suggest a line to follow up and he would use it. And in that way we started writing each other's material. And it got to the point where Terry actually wrote segments of Pete's editorial. Uh, I mean, he would show them to Pete and get his approval first I mean, before we, we ran them. But as I recall, these were all written on stencil. Uh, and much of what was written on stencil. And the stuff that wasn't an outside contribution was usually written on stencil. It might, might have been a first draft, but rarely. And sometimes I would write a paragraph or two of Terry's editorials. Terry wrote some of my editorials. It was fun. It was a, a, all of all of our fan act was fun because there were challenges to be met. Uh, I saw Terry as a better writer than me, and I, my challenge was to write up to his level. And I learned a whole lot doing that. I, I don't begrudge it in the slightest. And I think we rewrote some of your editorials, didn't we? Not that I know of, but I didn't type them on stencil either. <coughs> no, but I mean, you wouldn't, you didn't keep carbon, so you wouldn't have known if we changed a few words here and there. <laughs> well, my unerring <laughs> sense of style would have given you away. <laughs> keep telling yourself that. <laughs> 
So let's progress. Because that actually did happen later, as you'll see. Yes. And so uh, from here on out, what's the caption saying? It's a dummy panic button. He pushes it whenever he feels things getting on top of him. <laughs> now that is the fourth page of, of the cover. Right. You don't have the previous box story pages there. Now, Void 28, I'm curious to see what you have of that. Because Void 28 is yes. a five page cover. What is that strip of type across it? It's, it was on the. Full size uh, version, please click. Right. So this, this is this is what I got sent. So yeah, uh, something happened when I was capturing that uh, from Vanak. Uh, now this is the Void Boys at Towner Hall, and uh, which has the Void Boys song in it, the original song, and Bob came to me about oh. A week or two, maybe three weeks before we were going to publish the issue, and said, I can't finish this. I want to, but I don't have the time. He was working for TV Guide by then. And uh, what he had were three out of five pages, because this is going to be a five page cover, three out of five pages. Uh, pencil. First page was mostly <clears throat> inked, and the final pages didn't exist. And so he gave all that to me. I sat down and scripted the final page. Then I gave all that to Steve Stiles, who was at that point, this was 1961, very early in his fan art career. But I thought he could handle the challenge of sort of faking Bob's style and penciling the remaining pages, which he did. Once he did that, I inked everything, everything that Bob hadn't already inked. You made yourself look like that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 All the editors are there. Deep inner knowledge revealed in your pen. I'm the guy with the larger head. <laughs> well, nobody really knew what you looked like. I know. Whereas, whereas I they know knew what Terry and I looked like. But they knew what Jim looked like. So, <laughs> so, so are these, are these this went through a very elaborate process where after I had inked the pages initially, <coughs> I photostatted them. And I took the negative. Photostatting goes through two processes, a negative and a positive. And uh, I took the negatives and did additional work on them with Bendy recipient screens, and essentially whiting things out by blacking them, and then had those turned into positive stats, and then had those electro stencil. So that was a five-page cover that was. Uh, the most elaborate one we ever did, but the very last of Bob's. And Void 29, I don't think we have, to, yeah, we do have the cover. Yeah. All right. Void 28 came out around February of uh, 62. And then other things happened. I gave up the Mimeo shop and my apartment in Greenwich Village and moved to Brooklyn to a seven-room apartment on two floors with a backyard and a pear tree. <laughs> and uh, that was, that discombobulated things. Terry was into a, a, a professional writing career much more by then. He was also working for Scott Meredith Literary Agency. and He didn't have as much time for fan acting. And we just didn't do Void. I I worked on Void 29 in that spring. I, I stenciled maybe half of it. I had all the material for it. Uh, but it just sort of sat to one side. What year is this? 62. Right. And, and one of the pieces I had for it was a piece that had been Richard, written by Richard Geis which uh, 
was an editorial that he'd done for the original Psychotic, but at a time when Psychotic was being half-sized litho by a company in St. Louis called Swift and Company, I believe. They did other fanzines as well. But they rejected his editorial. They told him they wouldn't print it. So he in turn sent that editorial to Harlan Ellison, who stenciled it for Dimensions. This would have been in somewhere 54 or 55 at the latest. And then Harlan, of course, never published another issue of Dimensions because he moved to New York and went pro. So the Dimensions file floated around for a long time and various people got their hands on it, took material from it for their own fanzines, and eventually it ended up with me. And uh, I actually combined Dimensions with my fanzine Stellar back in the late 50s, did two issues of it sent it to 250 of Harlan subscribers, none of whom responded in the slightest way. So this was the one remaining piece that actually wasn't in the Dimensions file. It had been pulled from the Dimensions file by Ron and Cindy Smith for their fanzine Inside at some point in the late 50s, but they hadn't published it. Then a guy whose name was John White, who's not a relative but a good friend, took over Inside, which ultimately yeah, became exactly. Riverside Quarterly. But he found it in the files, and it didn't fit what Inside had become, so he gave it to me. So it ended up in Void, and or it would eventually in Void 29, but we didn't do anything on Void 29 for seven or eight years. It wasn't until a New Year's Eve party I had, which I believe was in 6970. No, 68. 68, 69? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. You remember better than I. Um, we got, sir, John Berry was there, Arnie Katz was there, various other people were there. It, it was the one party I threw for all of New York fandom. And uh, the subject of this came up that, you know, we were, all the stuff's been sitting around now for quite a few years. It's time to do something with it. Uh, let's, let's actually publish it. So we had this little whirlwind session in the next, I don't know, what, three days? Something like that. Something like that, in which all the re remaining material was stenciled. Uh, both John and Arnie Katz wrote editorials, so we had more editorials than usual. I wrote Greg's editorial because there's no time to ask him to write anything. And, and so it was largely a pastiche of Greg's editorials, drawing on material that he had in earlier editorials, but not exclusively. Uh, but it continued the void tradition of editors writing each other's editorial. Yes. <laughs> and once we were going to publish it, we didn't have a, a Bob Stewart uh, cover for it. But the actual cover, do you have the actual cover? No, this is all I got. Just it. this. Okay, well, the actual cover was an Adam cartoon was uh, done in the style of a hyphen cover with the void logo rendered like a hyphen logo. And uh, it was based on a Bob Shaw criticism of, of the early 60s voids and, and, and the way we wrote. And uh, it's a fake issue of hyphen, right? <laughs> but, but the whole point of it was that we used this Bob Shaw quote. Which is, I have a piece of chicken caught in my teeth. <laughs> Where are you guys in spaces? Yeah, well, that was my, our contribution. So right. He said that we were writing about inconsequential stuff. And so I transposed that into a scene of two people in spacesuits on the moon or somewhere who can't do anything about it. But by the time we published it, this was fan history. So I asked Lee Hoffman, who had done three issues of a fanzine called Fan History, if I could use the name, and we created this cover, Fan History Number Four, and that is Lee's logo, and uh, a Bob, little Bob Stewart character there, 
I'm not sure whether Bob actually drew that. That's keywordy out. I'm not sure we drew that or we just copied it from something he'd drawn earlier. Yes, that's the name of that character, Q Wordy Up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on my Q Wordy Up for us. Well, the, uh, the one thing, of course, that everybody has been waiting for and to finish up the panel, right. uh, <coughs> the Boyd Boys song sung by the Boyd Boys themselves. Wrong. No? To finish up the panel, we have Ted to, move, to move on to <laughs> Louis Ortez and the, and the best of Boyd. Okay, Louis? Could be. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I'll make this very quick. It's, just, it's a best of void that's going to come out probably in a year or so, and that's it. All right. You can call it fan history number five. Greg, Greg and Jim are selecting the material from the first 13 issues, and then Greg and I are selecting the material from the remaining issues. Right? So make sure a bunch of copies come to Corflu that, kind of, that comes out. You'll do. Uh, you do also well. have an article that. Is we has, uh, has published in the band uh, in the book you just did, uh, an art reflecting on how boy changed my life by essentially teaching me how to write. Uh, <laughs> so that when I got to graduate school, I entered an FNSF contest, a short story contest, won it, and won a live subscription to FNSF because I had been practicing in fanzines where no pros could see me. Same thing, <laughs> Jerry Carr and I did. Exactly right. And uh, Oh, by the way, we'll also probably have an introduction by John Henry Holmberg about the impact of Boyd in his time and in European fans. Mm -hmm. Because after all, the first 13 issues published in Deutschland mm -hmm. or Dallas. Well, not the first 13. Yeah. The first, what, five or six? Because, no, they were the first seven or eight. The, oh, <coughs> Boyd's one to ten were published in Germany. Okay, yeah. And Giesen uh, and Frankfurt. Well, okay, to try to bring to a conclusion this, I would suggest uh, that I uh, read the Boyd song. The Boyd Boy songs is fairly long, actually. Uh, it isn't really. Greg wrote more of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's longer. It, it really <laughs> with the Boyd Boy song. You can't write more and have it be shorter. That's, so That's the only the first form. stand. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I suggest that we sing only that. Okay. Yeah. But the Just copies of, of the phone song are available at a small price. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did put the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, actually, yeah. But I and always there should be a reprise at the I end. always felt that after the first sort folks chorus, there should be a, a shrill three notes for on a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to imagine that part unless somebody has a kazoo. Should we try to sing this? Let's do it. Three. Two. Keep in mind there is no melody. <laughs> <laughs> Not in his part. There won't be. <laughs> okay, should we start? Okay. Yeah, let's try. Three, two, one. We are the boy boys. We make a lot of noise. We sing songs of fandom, hitting out at random. For we are all co editors of Boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's our second panel. And so, just uh, thank you to uh, the Benfords and Ted and Lewis. And of course, uh, there will be another.